Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com, and today we are in game number five of the 2021 World Chess Championships being held in Dubai. This is a best of 14 series. First player to seven and a half points will be the world champion. You get a full point for a win, you get half a point for a draw. Competitors, obviously the champion, Magnus Carlsen, defending his title against Jan Nepo. He won the Canada's tournament earlier in the year. First four games have all been draws. Jan Nepo has the white pieces today trying to break through. Remember, before this, these players had played 13 times, and Jan Nepo had a better classical rating against Magnus Carlsen. So he definitely has the upper hand historically. We'll see if that translates into some victories here in the World Championship. So he starts out with pawn to e4, as he has done in the first two games, uh, game one and three, that he played the white pieces. Magnus defends the same way, e5, knight to f3, knight c6. Bishop to b5, so getting into the Rai Lopez that we have seen before. a6, Bishop comes back to a4, and so definitely looks like we are seeing similar moves to game one and game three. Then we'll just have to figure out if they decide to change things up at some point. So knight to f6, castle on the king side. Bishop to e7, rook here to e1, bishop to b5, bishop comes back here to b3, and then castle on the king side. So the first seven moves have all been identical to game one and game three. This is the anti uh, martial setting up for, you know, typically you have your, your martial attack with pawn to c3, but so far, Jan Epo, he, game one, he opted for h3. And in game three, he opted for a4. You know, both of those are the anti-martial, really getting away from the c3 and then black pushing forward with d5. So it does not seem like uh, Jan's really looking to play that. He goes back to the well with a4. So exactly what he played in game number three, he plays here on h4. And this is where some of the psychology in chess comes in, especially at the highest level. I think more than any other player, Magnus Carlsen really respects Jan Nepo. You can tell this if you watch any of the interviews, um, if you just listen to how Magnus Carlsen talks about his opponent, knowing their history they've had when they played classical chess. Nepo's a smart guy. Magnus knows that. There's a reason that he's playing A4 here. He just played that in game number three. You know, you look at game number one. It was a draw, and so game number three, he changes it up. Instead of playing h3, he now plays a4. He's going back to the same move that he played before. So Magnus Carlsen, being a smart guy, is like, why would he do that unless he thinks he can get an advantage at some point if I keep repeating the same move? So Magnus Carlsen in game number three played bishop here to b7. Magnus Carlsen says, okay, if you're going to do this, you have you have something going on here, and I don't want to figure out when and where that's going to take place, so I'm not going to play any more moves that are the same. I am now going to be the one to change it up. And so that's exactly what he does, and he plays rook to b8. Now we see an exchange here on b5. The pawns come off the board. Now pawn to h3, so similar setup on the king side that we have seen in the previous games here. Pawn to d6, pawn here to c3, which typically means, especially in this opening, pushing forward to d4 is the play. Especially after you see d6, you're not as worried about uh, black pushing immediately here to d5. So after c3, uh, fully expected something like bishop here to d7 and then d4. Maybe we start to see some... Uh, pieces come off the board, rook to a8 is pretty common, rook takes, queen takes here, maybe knight to a3 attacking this pawn here on b5 that can't easily be protected by the pawn on c7. But we see something that I think is uh, fairly interesting for Magnus Carlsen. He plays pawn to b4, which we, we can still see white continue just push forward here with d4. And then maybe there's an exchange right here. After the pawn takes, pawn takes right here. You could also take it with his knight, but then you have an isolated pawn here on the C file. So I think many times white might just take with their pawn right here. Maybe pawn D5 and then pawn E5. But we see after the move B4, we see D3, which I think is also pretty interesting. We're, we're definitely not in the book lines. This is, this is new theory we're seeing right here from the player. So a lot of prep seems to have gone in to this specific position. Pawn takes on C3. 
pawn takes, so neither side has the isolated pawns that we just looked at. Maybe part of the reason they wanted to play that. Knight 2, d2 here. Pawn takes. Pawn takes here on e4. Now they do have the isolated pawns here on the c file, but you can also see it's fairly mirrored for both sides as far as both material and setup. The isolated pawns both on the c file. Both sides have all of their material outside of their pawns, and both of the uh, pawns here on the e file are locked on the e4 and e5 square. So queen to c2 doing double duty here, protecting this pawn on e4, also protecting the pawn here on c3. Pawn to h6, just protecting this square here on g5, similar to how this pawn on h3 is defending this square here on g4 from the knight coming in. Knight comes back here to f1, preparing to come over here to g3. And we see a similar thing for Magnus Carlsen. Knight back here at e7, preparing to come to G6, that's exactly what we see. G3 and then G6. Bishop here to E3. Queen over here to E8. Rook to D1, getting into an open file. You always want to put your rooks on open files where there's no pawns. It can freely control the entire file or semi-open. If there's just one pawn on the file, that's also going to be good for the rook. Bishop here to E6. We do see... Jan's not ready to trade off quite yet. Plays bishop here to a4, attacking the queen. Bishop comes back to e7. Knight to d2, just rearranging. Moved it over to the king side, uh, but then realized, hey, there's just not going to be too much with both of my knights here. So the knight on f3, it's been hanging out there since the beginning, now comes back to d2. Bishop takes, so we do see an exchange. Magnus Carlsen typically likes to have his bishop pair. So the fact that he's the one to initiate the trade uh, makes it seem like he's not going to be the aggressor in this game for black. Queen takes. Rook takes here on a4, so the queens come off the board. Now the kings can start to get involved into the action at some point. Rook over here to a8. We do see the exchange of pieces. Going down, and you can start to see it's going to be difficult for either side to really get an advantage, mostly because of how symmetrical the board is, and they have the exact amount of material. So really hard to see any side, unless someone messes up, which so far we've played four and a half games now. This game's not over, but there really hasn't been any mistake, even a slight mistake, which is crazy to think about. These players are playing you know, hours and hours a day and just not making any mistakes. It's the highest level of classical chess uh, for sure. Rook here to a6 was kind of hoping in this spot that we see something like knight to f6. Uh, attacking this bishop right here. This is a great outpost for this knight. Um, I think it's really the only thing that we can look at and say, how can white be aggressive and try to go for a win here? You know, rook to a6, attacking the bishop, but the bishop's not going. You know, it's not going to trade off his rook for the bishop. So I thought this was, you know, incrementally improving his position, but not really changing anything. Magnus Carlsen is not going to lose his position after rook to a6. Knight to f5, though, I think it's interesting. That's not what he plays in the game. Knight to e8, Magnus Carlsen plays. King over here to f1, starting to get the king ball into the game. And then knight to f8. So this really signifies to me Magnus Carlsen is all in on the defense train. Not necessarily trying to rearrange his material. I mean, this knight here on e8, it's not coming here to d6. It's not coming here to c7. Yes, it can defend this this bishop, but that's about it. It doesn't really need to do anything else with it. So he's in full defense mode. Yeah, I'm trying to hold on to uh, this bishop, and I can rearrange elsewhere. But other than that, it's not going to come to g7, so it just comes back to the same square that it was. So full defense mode for Magnus Carlsen. No longer trying to win. So this is where I really think Jan should try to be very aggressive. Starts out with knight to f5, so I think that is the best move for him. Knight here to e6, knight up here to c4, attacking this bishop. Rook to d8, holding down the bishop. Pawn to f3, just solidifying the pawn chain right here. Pawn f6, same thing. Starts pushing forward here with g4. King f7, pawn to h4, just pushing here on the king side. Bishop comes back to f8, remember, uh, in a full defensive mode, there's not too many moves that Magnus Carlsen has. His pieces are pretty much blocked off. King here to e2. Knight here to d6. Knight takes. Bishop takes here. Uh, and then pawn to h5. You start to look at it, and it's very difficult to figure out how you can actually break through because 
both sides are so symmetrical. You, you can't really, you know, sometimes you'll have the pawn advantage on one side of the board, and so you kind of rotate all your pieces to that side and see if you can get advantage. In this case, you don't really see that coming into play. So bishop comes back to f8. Uh, you kind of see this song and dance just moving back and forth between the 7th and 8th rank here from Magnus Carlsen. Rook over here to d5, rook to a8. Rook down here to d1, and Magnus Carlsen says, you know what, uh, yeah, I have a pretty fine position right here, so I'm just going to attack your king here, uh, kind of be uh, annoying, but other than that, that, there's not too much that he's trying to do. He doesn't have any other material uh, that can really help him. The knight just can't come down because this bishop is defending both of those squares, so the rook's in it by himself, but it's going to be pretty easy to, to block, and that's exactly what we see in Epo play, rook to d2 blocking that, and then we see just a continued repetition and so it is a drawn game after 42 moves so for anyone that projected that there would be a draw i don't know how you could have ever projected that but game number five is a draw five draws in a row i know many of you are looking for uh, a win but uh, I think in some ways th these players are trying. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure that the anti-martial lines that Jan Epo is playing are going to do the trick against Magnus Carlsen. Every time he plays it, Magnus Carlsen is getting better and better at defending it. And Magnus Carlsen is one of those players that if he understands an opening and what you're trying to do, it's going to be very hard for him to break through. So, I think he's going to have to try something pretty darn creative uh, to break through against Magnus Carlsen. He's done it in the past, and he has not used these lines. So curious to see if he, if he changes that up. But thank you guys so much for watching uh, the videos, even in the draws. Hopefully, they are still entertaining and you're learning something. It is the highest level of chess. So there's not going to be a ton of mistakes. It just is what it is. But it's still a fun series, and I'm glad you guys are joining in with me. So thanks again. I'll see you guys in the next video. Remember, there is a break tomorrow. They have two days on, so they had game four and five. There will be a rest day tomorrow, but we will be back in two days for game number six, hoping for Magnus Carlsen, the white pieces, does something creative. See you guys.